Hi, my name's Sarah. Um, Mr. Kumar here very kindly has offered to come and talk to us about vitreous hemorrhage. So, Mr. Kumar, can you start by telling us what is vitreous hemorrhage, i.e. kind of what's bleeding where? Good. So, we're talking to you, right? No. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Do you go there, So, the first thing to know is what is the vitreous cavity? Mm -hmm. So, with a bit of anatomy, mm -hmm. you know that the eye's got the sclera, the cornea. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the uveal tissue, which is your iris and the choroid. Then you've got the retina. Mm -hmm. And then what's enclosed in that cavity is the vitreous space. And in the front, before the iris, is the aqueous space or the anterior chamber. And everything behind the iris, you've got the lens. And everything behind that is the vitreous. Okay. The vitreous is jelly, which fills the eye up. And luckily, a bit like the appendix, it's disposable. So you don't really need it. And it's made of this clear substance with collagen fibrils and a lot of hyaluronate, so it's very water-based, but it's got some protein in it, and everyone has it. When you're born with it, it's very solid. So if we look at this model here, and we just try and take off this eye, so the white bit is a sclera. Okay. All that is a uvea. You'd imagine there's a cornea there. That's the iris. Yeah. And if we open it up, as I said, you've got the lens. Yes. Everything in front of that is the anterior chamber. And as we go back, the whole bowl is now filled with this thing. And that's called the vitreous. Okay. Okay. Now that is what is your vitreous cavity, and that's filled with this jelly-like material, which is all clear. You can see through it clearly. Mm -hmm. And everyone's got a vitreous. And the vitreous effectively is this jelly material, which is attached weakly to the retina mm -hmm. in most places, and firmly in certain places. Okay. And it's very firmly attached at something called the aura. So the aura is the most anterior part of your retina, and mm -hmm. that's where the vitreous forms something called a vitreous base where it's really stuck yeah, down exactly. in a 360 degree configuration. So if you imagine, it's going to be stuck down quite firmly here. It's stacked quite firmly to the disc, which is the nerve coming yeah. out. So the jelly is attached quite firmly there. And then it's got these attachments elsewhere. It's got an attachment to a vein, attachment to the blood vessels. And in the macula, which is the seeing part of the eye, the center part of your vision, it's got its lacunas, it's got the premacular bursa. So a bit of anatomy about the vitreous. Now, all of us know that, you know, that when you get older, or if you're very short-sighted, people see floater, so they think, see things like flies. And that's just the vitreous jelly, which is liquefying, undergoing some changes, all the proteins are clumping up together, okay. and that's what you see as floaters. So any bleed in this cavity is a vitreous hemorrhage. Right. Okay? You can get vitreous hemorrhage for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And the most common cause of a vitreous hemorrhage in somebody who, say, is got no other systemic disease, so they're not diabetic, they have no other pro health problems, mm -hmm. and they come in, and their symptoms will be things like, I got some flashing lights, and then I saw these black things in my vision, and then I saw something like a candle wax dripping, which you see in bedrooms, yep. and then my vision's gone all down. And that's what they normally describe. So they get a lot of flashing lights, a lot of floaters, lots of black floaty bits, and describe the blurring vision. Mm -hmm. and when they come to you, you look at them, and you examine them, and you see the vision is down, so yep. they can't see much. And when you look at the eye, the eye has no signs of infection or inflammation. That means it's a nice white eye, mm -hmm. but you can't see the back of it. So like the patient can't see in front, you can't see the back of the eye because this whole space, which is clear jelly, mm -hmm. has now got something which is not so clear, which is blood. Right. And so when you look at the back of the eye, you've dilated them, you look at them with your lenses or your indirect, and because there's something there, it's called a media opacity. That means there's something now obstructing your view between what you want to see and the retina. Yeah. And that normally is this clear jelly, but now it's got blood in it, and that's a vitreous hemorrhage. Okay, so you've covered quite nicely what the patients describe. Do they ever get any pain or anything with this? Not really. The, the most common symptom that they get is, a, is this flashing lights, floaters, and a mm. decrease in vision. Some people will come and say there's a misting of vision. Yeah. Some people say I saw, see lots of cobwebs, spidery things, but everyone describes their floaters in their own way. But the most common one you hear is cobwebs, flies in my vision, or this lava lamp kind of thing where they will actually tell you, I saw something red coming down in my vision, and then I couldn't see any further. Fine. And um, are there any conditions that predispose to vitreous hemorrhages or other yeah, causes? Absolutely. So if you kind of look at people who've got systemic risk factors, mm -hmm. then the most common one that we would see would be diabetes. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so diabetes, as you know, yeah. in its essence, either shuts down blood vessels or makes them leaky, and in most people, there's a combination of the two. If you've got a shutdown of blood vessels, yeah. the eye thinks you need to create more blood vessels. There's a VEGF drive. There's lots of pro-angiogenic factors floating around and there's new blood vessels that form. Mm -hmm. Now when these blood vessels form, looking at that model again, they form from the retina and they grow onto the vitreous which forms like a scaffold for them to grow onto. Yeah. And that jelly, as I explained to you, is very liquid. 
so it's moving all the time. Every time you're moving your eye, even when you're sleeping, you're moving your eye all the time, that jelly is constantly in flux. And if these thin blood vessels are there, it's going to pull on them, cause them to bleed. So in a diabetic, the commonest cause of vitreous hemorrhage is going to be neovascularization or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and then they bleed. Yeah. And in the days when we didn't have any screening programs, so that means nobody looked at their eyes, people presented to you with these hemorrhages because they didn't get seen when they had background changes where you could have treated them, prevented this from happening, yeah. you saw them at the end stage. The other common condition, if you look at a community-based, is in Afro-Americans, the common cause will be sickle cell. Right. So again, people think the sickle cell, what will it do to the eyes? But it is a common cause of vitreous hemorrhage. So in people who've got sickle cell disease, more sickle cell traits, so the HBSC, S tau, rather than the SS, mm -hmm. they actually get more florid eye manifestations than people who've got pure sickle cell SS. Right. And in them again, there was a lot of work done in Jamaica. People previously used to think you need to laser these and you need to do some treatment for them. But now we know with our cumulative experience of more than 20 years, that these kind of infarct themselves. So because they're sickling even in the new vessels, the new vessel will actually just shut down themselves. So a lot of times now we don't do anything unless it's very significant. A lot of the hemorrhage will clear out on its own and you leave them well alone and they do quite well. And if people have had previous ocular conditions, so things like a vein occlusion. If they've had a vein occlusion, then again, there's VEGF drive because there's ischemia, there's new vessels forming. If it's not treated in time, they're gonna get a vitreous hemorrhage and that's gonna be the commonest cause for them to lose vision. Thank you. And um, you mentioned already looking at with the indirect ophthalmoscope. How do you die? Uh, other than that, how do you diagnose it? What do you do when someone presents with this? So if you see someone where they you they're complaining of these typical symptoms, you yeah. look at the back of the eyes. So you've got to dilate them. Don't yeah. try and not do anything undilated. You dilate them, and you have a look, and you can't see anything. Yeah. And you're suspecting there's something between me and the retina. So there's a media opacity which I can't see through. Yeah then you're not going to be able to see anything. You can try with the indirect because it's a brighter source of light and it'll get through more light through the pupil, but otherwise you need to do an ultrasound. So if you do an ultrasound, it's very much like an ultrasound in any other part of the body, you're going to get a good idea as to exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. So on the ultrasound, what you're trying to see is you focus on the eye, you then focus onto the jelly and you're going to be, see, be able to see the vitreous hemorrhage because it looks different than a normal vitreous cavity, which is all black and nice. A vitreous hemorrhage looks more hyperlucent, it's white. And the other things you want to look at then is that why is this vitreous hemorrhage happened? So is there an associated retinal detachment? Right. So in somebody who has no underlying condition, so they're not diabetic, they're not sickle cell, they've had no previous eye problems, the commonest cause of vitreous hemorrhage is a retinal detachment or a retinal tear. And unless proven otherwise, that's the cause of it. So in somebody young who walks in, is fit and well, has no other problems, but has come with a vitreous hemorrhage, you're thinking there has to be a tear mm -hmm. or there has to be a detachment which is causing this. Okay. Now, if there is a detachment, you can tell the difference between a detachment and a vitreous hemorrhage on the ultrasound. You need to be trained, you need to kind of have an index of suspicion for it, but you can quite easily tell the difference between the two. Okay. Sometimes it's a bit difficult, but there are enough clues to make you tell the difference. And in very good hands, you can actually see a small tear in the retina. Okay. But the important thing is that you kind of do the ultrasound, you've spoken to the patient, you know there's no other cause for them to have a vitreous hemorrhage. And if there is a dense vitreous hemorrhage, we would tend to be quite aggressive. So we tend to say, well, if there's no other cause, there's a dense vitreous hemorrhage, then either there's too small a tear, which we can't see on the ultrasound because the axial resolution is not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so you go in. So you would then operate early because blood is great for scarring. Mm -hmm. So I had a big cut out here, it scarred very nicely, left me with a little bit of scar, but no problems. Mm -hmm. The retina is like this thin layer, which needs to sit flat. If that gets scarred, it crumples up. And once it's crumpled up, it's not gonna sit flat. It's like an electrical circuit. If it's not touching, it's not working. Mm -hmm. If it's all crumpled, it's not gonna sit down flat and you're gonna have a retinal detachment. And people with blood in the eye, with a tear, it's a scaffold for scarring of the retina, gonna go badly. So we tend to go in quite early, clear out all the blood from the inside of the eye. So you go into the eye, remove all that jelly. You can then inspect the retina, see what's the cause of that. Treat a tear, treat a detachment, and you've got it all sorted. So that's the definitive management um, of a vitreous hemorrhage, exactly. Yeah. So in somebody who's diabetic, you can afford to wait. Oh, right. you, could, you could see them with a vitreous hemorrhage. You know that there's neovascular disease that's caused this problem. So you've got time. You can just wait and see how things go. You normally wait for three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. You do serial scans if you're worried. Yeah. And as long as the retina is flat, you're not worried. Right. And you wait for that hemorrhage to just resolve on its own. And most people, it does. Mm -hmm. And the people who it doesn't, or they're getting recurrent hemorrhage, that means they come to you and they say, listen, I was doing great. And then again, it's gone bad. Then you think, well, this is a recurrent hemorrhage, there's a pull that's causing this to bleed recurrently. You want to then remove that traction because they're not bleeding because there's a new vessel, they're bleeding because something's pulling on that new vessel, causing mm -hmm. to spurt out a little bit of blood. Once you get rid of that jelly, you remove that traction on the blood vessel, hopefully they're not going to get any bleeding. Okay.
Okay. And that surgery is vitrectomy? That surgery is a vitrectomy. Okay. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So just to finish off, um, we ask everybody, okay. say I'm a trainee GP or okay. an F2 in A&E or okay. a final year med student, coming okay. to finals, okay. what are the most important takeaway points to know about vitreous hemorrhage? So for a GP trainee or an F2, if the person is fit and well with no other ocular conditions, they come in with what they describe sounds like a vitreous hemorrhage, you dilate them, you can't see the retina, you need to send them on straight away yeah. to a specialist center. Doesn't need to be done at midnight, but within the next 24 hours, they should be seen because it must probably have a tear or retinal detachment. Yes. On the other hand, if you know somebody and you see their notes and they've had lots of red laser before for diabetes, yeah. and they've got a bit of vitreous hemorrhage, you don't need to panic at two o'clock in the morning. If that most probably is a retinal detachment, as long as it gets seen within the next 48 hours, somebody can have a look at them, but don't miss the, young person who has no other condition will probably have a detachment or a tear which needs to be treated sooner rather than later. Don't sit on it for weeks on end. If somebody's got a lot of underlying condition, most probably that's the cause why it's happened. Excellent. Thank you so much. Take care, Sarah. Thank you.